production underwriting for Ruckus has been made possible in part by the generous contributions from Fred and Lou Hartwig and from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon, joined by the Ruckettes, Kansas City Star editorial writer, Yale Abahaka, <coughs> Urban League CEO and President Gwen Grant, media and communications consultant, Mary O'Halloran, and lobbyist Woody Kozad with the Kozad Company. <laughs> Kansas City Star columnist Steve Rose is suggesting that Jackson County should set aside competitive inclinations and learn from Johnson County about how to pass a tax for medical research. Steve notes the similarity of the proposed Jackson County program to the Education and Research Triangle approved by Johnson County voters in 2008. The half cent sales tax will be on the Jackson County ballot in November and if approved will raise $800 million over 20 years. So is Mr. Rose's well-intentioned advice Good advice, Mary. <laughs> the Jackson County should set aside if it's competitive proclivities. I, I've never noticed that, all that, but uh, is his good advice good? Well, Steve, when he writes about Johnson County and its, his, its achievements, is almost some kind of, it's sort of, he's impervious to the facts sometimes. But <laughs> let's put it this way. Uh, he says it's a huge success. We could have a whole show on whether that tax in Johnson County is a, quote, huge success. Well, let's have a short segment and <laughs> yeah, ask you, yeah. is it not a huge success? Well, I, it, there's no way for an ordinary citizen to, to say that. What it has done is built some buildings. It has acted as a catalyst for federal money, especially for K-State. It is essentially a pass-through of tax dollars. Uh, uh, to the university's Board of Regents in Lawrence, or in Topeka, rather, from the people of Johnson County through to K-State, KU, and Kansas University Hospital. And this little board they have that kind of meets once in a while and says, good way to go, all of you, keep doing it, is fine. My problem, I have a problem with Steve's. I like his writing, you know that, and I'm a big Steve fan, have been on the show many right. times. But at the end of this commentary of his, he says, oh, and by the way, about the money, <laughs> About the $800 million, it's unfortunate that Jackson County is asking for a half cent increase in the sales tax. Unfortunate, Steve. <laughs> Excuse me? And he says, it's, well, it's so unfortunate because that's really the only way to raise money. You know, you couldn't have had an increase in the property tax. That harms people on fixed income. What do you think an increase in the sales tax does to people? Uh I, well, you know, it's unfortunate. Well, it's very unfortunate. All right. The, the goal and of the, uh, the Johnson County yeah. facility to expand higher education offerings and cancer and food safety research in right. Johnson County, mm -hmm. and it's $15 million a year, right. yes, a partnership yes, among the county, KU, and K-State. Yes. Yes. Now, you said there's no economic inclination oh, no, to no, compete. no, I didn't say that. And there is indeed. We see it all the time with well, the no, eco Devo but, but war. The idea that jo Jackson County is essentially, the essentially own detra of this whole thing is is, okay. is getting along. Jackson it's County just backers, not true. Yale, do the Jackson County backers need help from Johnson County in terms of getting no. this passed? <clears throat> well, no. There, there are two very crucial points to make about this. One, the Johnson County tax is very much unlike the Jackson County tax. Very much. I, I, you know, I, I actually did call all three institutions <laughs> and found out how they're spending their money. Most of the money right now is going for buildings. It's not going for medical research, which almost all of the Jackson County tax would be used for. That's the first crucial difference here. Their money's going for public institutions. Over in Jackson County, it'd be going two of the three are private institutions, and they'd be doing almost all medical research. So that's, that is a crucial difference in saying, well, what, what, are they alike or not? Here's the second biggest difference, and Mary hit a little bit. They had an eight cent sales tax mm -hmm. in the most affluent county in this area. They want to have a half cent sales tax in the fifth poorest county in the metropolitan area. And they overreached, in my opinion. And I think that one of the things that uh, you can, and I wrote a comment about this today, you could ask, well, how come we can't get more private money into this and less public money? Again, if we were talking about an eight cent sales tax here today, quite frankly, it wouldn't be the big brouhaha. It certainly wouldn't be with me. But it, it, it is, because it's 800 million. 
it's not like the Johnson County tax. It's for medical research, which well, is speculative research my, as well. It's not basic I'm science research. I just add one thing. It is not. The, the differences are exactly, you've got it. By the way, your work on this subject has been very good. You're the only voice that's getting the facts about all this out on a daily basis almost give him jail. A Pulitzer. I will give him a Pulitzer. <laughs> it is, you know, and Mike, another thing is but, the supporters of this keep putting it out as if it were a new idea. It's not a new idea. I want to get Woody in here and something from uh, a very Gwen, important question. Possible. Why does research always come in triangles? Be more literate <laughs> to have a research rhomboid. But yeah. well, seriously, I think there are two things. This guy Bradshaw, I will be interested to see whether he can make his case that a this that's is the guy who thinks it should be a statewide tax. Statewide yeah. tax, and he's spending the money on the ads you're seeing on TV. Can he make his case that a it's just a money grab? And can he make his case that it isn't enough money to really do effectively what they're talking about? Uh, I haven't seen him make it yet, but I'm not saying he can't. I'm, if he does make that case, then to heck with it. We're, of course, yeah. running behind, so now we'll have to uh, try to <laughs> catch up. Only the man of steel or an act of God can stop the inexorable drive for a downtown starter streetcar system. Despite protracted battles over the election process, litigation at the State Court of Appeals, and the controversial choice of out-of-town companies to manage the plan, the streetcar seems to survive. Backers believe the system will be up and running from River Market to near Union Station by summer of 2015. What seemed improbable at the outset now seems inevitable. Who or what made this happen, Woody? Well, I think the credit goes to the mayor. Uh, look, he, he's, his end run around representative government uh, was, if democratically unscrupulous, tactically brilliant. Uh, he has shown, in addition to tactical <coughs> genius, uh, steady determination uh, it, throughout in all kinds of challenges, which you've just run over. Um, and, and so in, in these ways, this determination and the tactical brilliance, you know, it's kind of like the first wave of, of the Wehrmacht going into the Soviet Union. But we're only at Minsk. Hmm. Uh, if you're talking about this as a starter <laughs> system, you're talking about going to Moscow. And you ain't there yet. Yep. And so the first thing to say is, he, he has demonstrated real leadership on this. The mayor has. I mean, we've actually got two leaders in this area. The governor of Kansas and the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, are actually putting out policies and getting them executed. And that's something really novel around it. Uh, this shows what the establishment can accomplish if it decides to try and accomplish something. Is well, that correct? Well, except it's not really civic leadership doing this. And it's really a ground, you know, as well, you mentioned, political it's establishment. Grassroots, grassroots people who got out the 400 people or whatever it took to pass the sales <laughs> tax and the property tax increases or assessments. But I will say, you know, there have been a lot of people who call this a toy train and all that kind of thing and, and lament where it's going. Yeah. Downtown, since it's been announced, you got the new hotel coming along. You have Cordish with new off apartments. Just yesterday, another one got submitted, which is, I'm sorry, approved on an apartment conversion. In downtown, downtown actually seems to be reacting to this idea of a streetcar positively. And again, from my perspective, sorry, transit people, this is not going to be a good transit mover. It could be a good development provider. Right. Well, uh, how are you tonight? We haven't heard from hey, you for a while. Hey, no, how's everything here. going? <laughs> hey, Ben, do you have here. anything to say about anything? Yes, I do have a lot yes. to say about a lot right, of go. things. Oh, let me just kind of go back to the tax now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get anything the in there. But, um, yeah, I, I agree with Yale and, and Woody on this one. The mayor did a great job, and you also have to credit the council, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for supporting it and moving forward, you know, making those tough decisions and getting this going. I think it's going to have great positive impact for downtown, for, uh, you know, uh, tourism and economic development. I think I, I'm really excited about it. So, uh, you know, we had to get, we, we're finally going to have a streetcar. Are there I think it's cool. any major obstacles that could stop the progress of the downtown yes, street? Building yes, building it. Once yes. they start building it and actually go into the hundred-year-old streets and start finding stuff down there that they thought they knew where it was and then that's not where it is. I mean, cost overruns and these things potential. Although Russ Johnson, a city council member, says we've got a huge, I think it's like $20 million or so contingency to take care of that kind of stuff. Oh, second. But, you know, I mean, the financing of it, at least for the two, two miles, is ready. But they're talking about the next step, and I think that's where, I mean, I don't know. Well, that's well, where the next problem is. Clark McCaskill brought home, what was it, $20, 20 million? million which no, is she actually, doesn't do that. Well, yeah, no, she, she doesn't. Yeah, that's right. I don't give her credit when he announced. A tiger <laughs> on hypocrisy, I give her credit. It was a $20 million tiger <laughs> grant. Tiger, tiger grant. stands for Transportation <laughs> Investment so she Generating the grant. Economic because, Recovery. Well, let's help you get
Let's though. say Claire was clear instrumental. About that. If the federal government doesn't have any more money to help subsidize this, yeah, that could be huge. <coughs> could be huge in, its, in terms of its expansion. And some people have criticized the mayor and the council for already planning the next branches of the. Why? You know, right, it's, that's what they these kinds of projects just <laughs> have to be planned years in advance, or they never happen. Look how many years it took to get the little starter line going through all and kinds Chast of Chastain types of even came out and said yeah. that, you know, really, that we should be putting more money into the streetcar than transformational medical research. Oh, too. great. Oh, oh, I He's may right. change my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so that may be the, that may be the <laughs> kiss of death for the project. The pro what, what about labor <laughs> unions? They didn't seem real happy about the selection of the two management companies to well, uh, run so, the project because well, they were not union. Mike, that's true, and that's one of those little inter-party or inter-feudal things we have going on in Kansas City. But at the end of the day, the council politically, it's kind of what he said, politically <laughs> and the mayor's leadership said, no, we're going to go ahead with it. Mm -hmm. And eventually, some of these guys and gals will get hired. But the real proof will be, if in two years it's up and running, then the next step might get built. Uh, there are other cities, I just read yesterday, there are like two or three other cities just approved multi-hundred million dollar expansions or startups yeah. of streetcar. It's kind of like the neat, cool thing now, especially for urban core areas. And I agree with Gwen, I'm glad we're going to have it. I hope it's up and running in two years. And then we go from there. And for it to expand regionally throughout Metro Kansas City, it has to first succeed in downtown. Oh, absolutely. Oh, and, and I mean, on be but on a development. Once development. upon a time, the neat cool thing was to get rid of your streetcar and get buses. Right. And we did the neat cool thing. And it's really neat. The no, it was to get so neat cars, cool. Woody. Really no, seriously, it was to get cars and go to the suburbs. The more, That's why we got rid of streetcars. The more things right. change, the more they stay the same. Well, there's that. The Democratic mascot nationally is the donkey. In Kansas, sometimes it seems to be a sacrificial lamb. That's when a candidate takes one for the party and runs for governor when nobody else will do it. It's too early to know whether Paul Davis will be a lamb or a lion, but he's certainly an underdog as he begins his campaign against Sam Brownback. Davis is the House Minority Leader, 41 years of age, a Lawrence resident, and practices law. He says if elected, he wants to focus on education, protecting the middle class, and rewarding hard work. How novel. And Yale, you write that a Davis versus Brownback race could be a real thriller. How did you reach that conclusion? Um, two things. One, just to really irritate the conservative colleagues like um, <laughs> Woody. Uh, but second, because things change in politics, and one year from now, who knows what it will be. It could be, hey, these tax cuts that you know, you give, and a lot of people give, uh, Bramette credit for passing through did not work for whatever reason. The economy's tanking, the jobs are not coming. So, the, I mean, something negative does have to happen for Paul Davis to have a chance. I would agree with that. And the second thing, which I always find interesting about Brownback, is the, the re repetitive thing, and Steve Kraske had in one of his columns, that his poll numbers aren't that great. And you would think that, well, a guy who's been pretty successful, senator, got elected but, but, but overwhelmingly that, but as that's governor. That's one poll, isn't it? Gail, there, there one that has there, been, yeah, there been historically a couple. And, and one of them was, was several months ago. So that's why I'm not saying, yeah. oh, wow, he's going to be you know, easily well, trampled. He's not but a, I do, he's not as popular as you might think. And so if Paul, need, Paul Davis needs something to happen in the next session, whether it's uh, you know, some weird thing to happen in the legislative session, and for the tax, for basically the Kansas economy to tank, which I'm not wishing on Kansas, I really am not, I keep coming back to that, you kind of hope something works out here, but if it doesn't work, then that could be laid at Brownback's feet. That, that is probably the well, only way, and as Steve Krasky said, if he gets a million or two million bucks, then he has a chance. It's always important to remember that in the state of Kansas, more years have been spent with a Democratic governor in the state's history than with a Republican governor. We have lots of Democratic governors, people that get elected. We actually have Congress people and so on. So the, the idea that you can't elect Democrats in Kansas is just not true. Secondly, Paul Davis is a is kind of a, the opposite of Brownback in terms of personality. He is anything but an ideologue. He is a very calm, soft-spoken, tall, blonde, soft, kind, gentle man wow. with a three-year-old child who's very much in love with his um, wife, Stephanie, and I had a chance to chat with him last week, as did a lot of other people at a gathering in uh, Johnson County, and he gave a very good speech, but it was like Paul. It was very, now here's what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to turn around the mistakes of the Brownback well, administration. It wasn't thrilling, Yale. 
but it was exactly what people thought. Does he need a said. media and communications consultant? <laughs> <laughs> well, Can we not. find him one? <laughs> I could recommend now, somebody. You, you know, he was part of the 2002 group, they were called the Sweet 16, of Republicans and moderate, uh, moderate Republicans and Democrats that put together a coalition that re really moved the state now, forward. Now, Steve Rose, guy. about whom we a spoke earlier, uh, said Davis must distance himself from Obama prove that he's not as liberal as he will be painted and has to attract moderate Republicans and independents. Tough, tough job, is it not, Woody? Yeah, well, it's going to be hard to separate himself from Obama, and uh, they, they will spend a good deal of money uh, joining him at the hip, and I suspect uh, they'll probably be successful. Look, Yale and I are kind of generally in agreement. Here's, if a year from now the state revenue has not collapsed and spending, state spending on education, public education, uh, continues at its present levels or increases, then Dave is going to have a hard time making his case that brownbacks wrecked the state. Uh, if a year from now uh, Kansas is attracting business and jobs in contrast to, sharp contrast to Missouri, uh, then brownback will have an easy time making his case. I expect both of those things to happen, uh, and so I expect brownback to win. But if, they, if it goes the other way, if those two things flip, then Brownback's got a heck of a fight. Look, if you do something, especially something that has some controversy to it, your num poll numbers fall. The way to keep your poll numbers steady is don't do anything. You know, go cut ribbons and give speeches. Brownback's doing Just, just the fact that he's been in office and is criticized constantly by some in well, the media, yeah, he's, some he's media done publications. He's not just no. any old Republican, Mike, for heaven's sake. That's he, right. He's he, done he, something. He's he a, acknowledges a successful that he wants one. radical uh, change, and he's getting but, radical but, change. By the way, the reason well, somebody running for governor as a Democrat starts at a disadvantage they win, of course, but they sometimes start at a disadvantage because there are 344,000 more registered Republicans in the state than there are Democrats. All the more reason why the ones that did win were terrific. Joan Finney, for example. Yes. She wasn't uh, bad at all. KU professor blames the NRA for the Washington shootings and is now on indefinite leave for shooting off his mouth. Journalism professor David W. Guth sent out a tweet on his personal Twitter account following the Navy Yard shootings that left 13 people dead, including the shooter. <coughs> Guth tweeted, the blood is on the hands of the hashtag NRA. Next time, let it be your sons and daughters. Shame on you. May God damn you. The episode has angered some state legislators who are calling for his termination. First question goes to Gwen. Do you think it's reasonable to link the shootings in Washington to the NRA? Well, I think the tendency is to, anytime you have a shooting, the NRA is going to come to mind because many people hold them responsible for the proliferation of guns in this country and their, their policies that prevent any type of efforts to control that proliferation. Uh, but with regard to this professor you know I, he, I think you know you know what he his intent was but the impact of it was certainly not what he expected and um, to make such a statement uh, was you know inappropriate but I think what this has has caused to surface is a much is a, a an issue of First Amendment rights and um, the right of an individual to make a statement on their private Twitter account. You know, how, <coughs> what, how is that going to look with regard to uh, First Amendment? You know, a, a lot of issues have surfaced as a result. I think his remarks were definitely inappropriate uh, to make a comment, uh, you know, that, that certainly speaks to um, the, the health or well-being of, you know, what wishing demise uh, uh, on anyone, I think, is inappropriate. Uh, but d is it a question of his First Amendment right? Uh, there, there's an organization called the Foundation for Independence. Individual Fe Rights Individual in Rights in Education. Fire. F uh, first and Fire. I mean, lots of people are starting to step well, up uh, on Some of the professors issue. at KU have About said 13 that, uh, or 14 professors he should be have reinstated. Should but Yale, priority. you made an interesting point in one of yeah. your commentaries. <laughs> uh, you said Guth hurts the gun control movement by yeah. the action he's taken. Yeah, I mean, I think He that, may be trying to help it, but he hurts it. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly there is <coughs> a restriction on how much far you can take the First Amendment. I mean, we, yeah. I live and die by that every day. Certainly, I also think there should be restrictions on the Second Amendment to a degree. So, I mean, I think, I think I'm think i consistent well, already in that are. regard, and there are. I mean, there are in both of them. Yeah. So, in this case, while when you know, I think we, we as in the gun control movement want to be united in saying NRA bad. Right. 
anything that you know gives sucker and comfort to the NRA is bad for our cause. And he gave them that comfort by saying, I think those children, basically implying that children of NRA members should be killed. Yeah, well, that, yeah no, that's, that's we bad. don't want that happening. That's bad. But the other issue is, is uh, with, with this is looking at um, the, if you look at the Navy Yard shootings and, and the whole issue of mental health um, and how these people are able to access these guns. The, the, coming back to the NRA, we've had two attempts in Congress to pass uh, legislation that would provide more gun control and would address mental health um, screenings in gun control as well as background checks and other issues and they've been voted down I mean by you know one time not I think eight missed by eight votes another by six mm -hmm. and I think you know the it's the NRA lobby when LaPierre will get on mm -hmm. on meet the press and uh, face the nation and talk about all of this we should do a better job of, of screening mental health yeah. folks but then because of your lobby the very you know the people that you're supporting well, vote against measures that would do and, exactly that. And I, and I that. think he points out too, though, if you do have these mental health laws, then you sometimes run into uh, some civil rights issues that are very serious and have serious consequences. Well, the mental Absolutely. health, but the, but the, I, but the mental health, well, but the legislation was going to address hang those on, who hang, have been hang, adjudicated hang, mentally Gail, ill. Uh, That's exactly uh, right. Win. And adjudicated <laughs> doesn't, you know, doesn't get all the people or anything close to all the people who are. But it gets uh, mentally ill, and uh, in, including apparently this guy, who is listening to you know who thinks low wave yeah. frequency stuff is affecting his mind, uh, and who's in there with a shotgun, which is one of the things the gun control people <coughs> always say they're not trying to regulate because those are used for hunting. Shouldn't have done uh, And and look, I'm more interested than Professor in what Ku's reaction is to this. It's stupid. He you know he's a journalism professor. Show it to the editor before you punch the send button. But it, it, it was a stupid, dumb mm -hmm. thing dumb. to do uh, in bad taste and appropriate, all these mm -hmm. things. A university has no business putting some, punishing somebody for saying something about a controversial public issue. I'm That's sure there's a limit well, somewhere, because, but well, uh, this, well, even I, I, this isn't I believe it. the professor I, I, finally agreed that he should be suspended at least for a while because yeah, there were death threats you know, to me, him just, and, and but, danger but to the campus. College campuses so we're, gonna we're, gonna to turn, to we're gonna turn this over to the people who threatened to folks. We're gonna let them make the We're going to try to prevent an action with weapons that might occur from a death threat. The professor should get a gun. He may have one. About academic freedom. And I am shocked that the president of the University of Kansas did not stand right. up and Amen. make this okay. clear right off the bat. All right. I, I don't it's, understand it. It's time it's, now it's, for it's Roast scary. and Toast, where the Ruckettes yeah. uphold or scold. And we start tonight with Woody. Uh, a toast to the eight members of the city council, I guess seven members and the mayor, uh, who voted to go ahead with the contract on the, on the streetcar, which I may not even be in favor of. But in this instance, they were presented with the local interest groups who wanted to stop this and rebid the contract. That was a really bad idea. And these eight did the right thing and said, no, we're not going to do this just because a bunch of local people are screaming at us. Uh, we've got the right bidding process. We've got the right contract. We're going ahead. Thank you very much. Well done. Yeah, I'm going to have to roast Senator Cruz for his non-filibuster <laughs> filibuster, wasting 21.5 hours of time in Congress filibustering about something to ultimately vote for the very bill he was filibustering or not filibustering. <laughs> totally ridiculous, but he is the poster child for what is wrong with the dysfunctional Republican Congress. Well, since when <laughs> you did Ted Cruz, you did it great. So I'll, I'll move on and, and uh, toast all the people who have stood up for academic freedom at KU and who have criticized the administration of the university for not coming out day one and saying this, this professor certainly didn't express the university's point of view. But like the Supreme Court said in 1972, I think it was, Woody, in Healy versus James, I think, that in no place in our country <coughs> is it more vital to protect the free speech of, of, of people and the free exchange, the marketplace of ideas than in our universities. And so great for those that are protecting academic freedom in Lawrence. Well, back to the medical research tax and uh, a toast to uh, Blue Springs Mayor Carson Ross. I asked him, are you going to be supporting the medical research tax? And he said, no. He also said he's not going to oppose it. 
Why? Because Blue Springs has its own half cent sales tax on the ballot, and he wants to spend all of his time, understandably so, promoting better parks in Blue Springs, which is what he thinks sales taxes are for. He does say that he thinks Jackson Countyans are smart enough to make their own decision on the medical research tax, and he hopes they realize they're only one county out of six. So I think I know where he's leaning. <laughs> and finally, a toast to the Kansas City Star editorial board, Yale, for questioning whether Wyandotte County Commissioner Terrence Maddox should remain in office, given what the Star calls a disturbing pattern of behavior. Plot is also for urging commissioners to fill Mayor Mark Holland's unexpired term on the Unified Government Board. The Star summarizes things correctly. Of 10 seats on the commission, one is empty, another is tarnished. That is not a good foundation for Holland as he takes over as mayor or for the citizens of Wyandotte County. And as a longtime citizen of Wyandotte County, I wholeheartedly agree with your assessment. And that is Ruckus for this week. We'll be back next week at the usual time, which is 7.30. Now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the Ruckus crew, Mike Shannon, thanks for watching and good night.